You have a uh, an Oscar statue over there on your right hand shoulder. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> What's he doing? <laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome back. To Not so small world. Today's episode is about Fantasia from 1940. And as you saw in the intro, we got to talk to John Canemaker, who's a pretty well-respected animation historian. He's an animator himself, a professor. Uh, he is he has many things. <laughs> and, an artist. <laughs> an artist, yeah. yeah. As you'll see from that interview, he was he was such a delight to talk to. He gave us more time than we had even asked for in terms of uh, interviewing him, and like just just an absolute sweetheart. So if you go to this time code right here, you can see our interview with John Canemaker. We normally have a certain structure to these episodes, but we're going to change it up a little bit this time, right? Mm-hmm. We are talking about our general thoughts about the whole thing, and then talking about each segment. Because Fantasia is divided up almost like a symphony, where you have these mini segments, so we're just going to kind of talk about them one by one. But in general, uh, this I, I love this movie. <laughs> what do you feel about it? I would say I love both of them equally. Um, yeah, this one and and, and 2000. Yeah, there's this one, uh, which was released in the 1940s, mm-hmm. and uh, then, then the other one was Fantasia 2000. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I mean, for me, this is this is a incredibly important movie in the history of cinema. There's mm-hmm. there's so few things like it. It is still like so inspiring and so like artful, and it just you know the the fact that it's willing to push itself as far as it does, like. I didn't like this movie very much as a kid. I watched it a few times, mm-hmm. but like I think Same. especially the the stuff in between the like Deems Taylor uh, monologues kind of bored me a little bit. But man, as an adult, this is one this is one of my favorite Disney. It, it might be my fa- I don't know if it's my favorite oh. Disney movie. It's one of my absolute favorite Disney movies. What an honor! And I love it more and more with every passing year. <laughs> and if it didn't have like a couple of the flaws we're gonna talk about, yeah, it's it's almost like one of the greatest films of all time. Maybe it still mm-hmm. is. Even with those flaws, it might be one of the greatest yeah. films of all time. That's how strongly I feel about this movie. <laughs> so Disney's lead collaborator on this whole thing was Leopold Stokowski, who was a well-known, well-respected conductor at the time. He was known for being kind of eccentric. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, for example, he wouldn't lead with a baton at all. He would do everything with his hands. Um, and he was also sometimes controversial. He would do sort of different, uh, interpretations of some of the works that he was performing instead of just following strictly to the, to the dime. So I think he was like a perfect choice for this whole experiment. And it's amazing when you read about the history of it, like Mm -hmm. how much involvement he really had, like he was constantly getting feedback with Walt. And it seemed like they kind of had like a playful relationship with each other. And he was just involved in pretty much every stage from seeing the art and and having ideas on like him and Walt would be sitting in Walt's mm-hmm. office just playing record after record for hours, like discussing what do you th- what do you see when you see this one or, you know, like what what uh, c- could we do this one? Is this even a good choice? And like narrowing down these options, like he just seemed like he had a blast like working on this with Walt. Uh, I think Walt like wanted some of that high art sophistication sort of Mm -hmm. credibility in a way. I think he was, I think he wanted something like that. Mm -hmm. Uh, One of the people that they got was the aforementioned Deems Taylor to do the little introductions uh, in between each segment. And he was a well-known radio broadcaster. He would talk about classical music and stuff. So people of the day probably knew him pretty well. Comes off a little dry today. Yeah. Like I said, little Joe was a little bit bored (laughs) by his, which is why in 2000, Mm -hmm. Fantasia 2000, they, I think, you know, they have celebrities kind of doing the in-betweens. Even then, I think they're a little, from what I remember, uh, I think they're a little goofy, you know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, but it, but it is a Disney-like movie. Right, They right. probably just wanted to keep the kids more, um, enter- not entertained, mm-hmm. but, um, what's the word I'm looking for? More engaged. Engaged, that's the word. Yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah I mean, uh, there was, they tried, like, the Disney story team tried to, like have little moments within Fantasia where he's talking like when they accidentally almost knock over some of the instruments and stuff to like Mm kind of take out some of the dryness and there was one point where they even considered dressing Deems Taylor up in a horse costume to (laughs) introduce the pastoral symphony which like that would be amazing Mm -hmm. I don't know I didn't do that um but yeah overall like it's it's fine they also had the 
I think the most fascinating thing they did with that was they had him interact with, with the sound wave. Yeah. Um, I thought that was a, a good way to break it up. Yeah, yeah. And I, I do love that you don't even see the title card of the whole production until that intermission. Mm -hmm. When they were coming up with potential titles, you know, there was a lot being knocked around. One of them was the Film Harmonic Concert. Another was Hybrowski by Stokowski. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Stokowski himself actually came up with the idea for Fantasia as the title, and it's just like, it's a composition that's very improv, it, it goes in unexpected ways, so I feel like that that is like a perfect summation. I mean, do you think that title really fits well yourself? Yeah, I think it's short and sweet, and um, at the time I heard of it, which was when I was young, Yeah. Um, I didn't know what it meant, but it had sounded like fantasy, which yeah. made it sound great to me. So I love fantasy. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, and then you put it in, and you're like, this is these aren't knights, these aren't uh, <laughs> dames and towers, <laughs> and just like the technical innovations that came with this. I mean, they had so many ideas about you know doing 3D or pumping smells in and stuff mm -hmm. like that. But the biggest thing that ended up being an actual part of it was this invention of Fantasound, as they called it, which was essentially like an early version of surround sound. And in limited theaters when this premiered, you had a system where there was sound in the back and sound on the side, and, and it really like enveloped you. And you know, today we kind of take that for granted, but back then it just sounds like it was just a, an extraordinary experience. Mm -hmm. You'd hear like even, um, you know, like the bell in, in Bald Mountain coming from way off behind you and stuff. And that must have just been crazy, especially with a film being projected really, really big on a screen as well. Right. Even the sound mixing was like, because you had those different channels, uh, it was it was like a whole new art that they were kind of playing around with and Stokowski himself would sit there and he loved playing around with what if I put this over here and this over mm -hmm. here and it just it just sounded like it was a really cool you know like exciting moment to be there like one of the incredible innovations with sound mixing that like typically you can't do with just a performed orchestral version of classical music is adjusting the volume of certain sounds uh, and so like, for example, our ears have a harder time detecting lower notes, mm. but when it comes to sound mixing for the first time, they could raise the low notes so that it matches, you know, like with your ear in similarity to the, the higher notes. And so even things like that, which, you know, some people might consider sacrilegious at the time, it, it was all playing around with the innovation of what could be done, like that had never been done before. They were both very experimental people in their, yeah. in their elements. They both liked, you know, pushing, pushing things forward. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, as a side effect, they really got a lot of people interested in classical music. You right. Know? So the very first segment after the introduction is Toccata and Fugue in D minor by Bach. And I hadn't seen Fantasia in a while before like we watched it again. Mm -hmm. And I had forgotten how just mind blowing that sequence is and how good it is and still like surreal and it's almost it almost feels like CGI at times. <laughs> it's just like <laughs> it was so ahead of its time and so strange. Um, it just, like, it makes me so happy to see them, like, going so experimental, and especially at a time where the, no one had seen, you know, much like that before. Right. I mean, there was, uh, people like Len Lai who were doing experimental stuff, and I think even, he, he was hired briefly at the studio to come in and play around with stuff, but, um, but still, like, the average American moviegoer had not seen anything like that. I think it's a good introduction to the whole... Uh, movie mm -hmm. um, introducing the idea of like now you can have visuals and music together because apparently that wasn't a thing at that time well, a lot of people even found it sacrilegious mm -hmm. they're like why would you take the beauty of a you know a, a classical orchestration and mm -hmm. feel like you need to add something more to it you know yeah this is well before music videos were common and stuff like that you know this was a good icebreaker this was like Here's how your brain might be visualizing it. Yeah. Um, like if you close your eyes, what are you seeing while you're yeah, listening, you know? Yeah. And then um, if you're not into it, then you don't have to watch the rest of the thing, you know? Like, <laughs> yeah. Well, not to mention, like, you know, it's it, it. this doesn't have to be the only way you listen to this music. It's just their interpretation. Yeah. It's, it's the Disney animators coming mm -hmm. up with what they, what they see. Then we have The Nutcracker Suite by Tchaikovsky. 
which like wasn't like insanely popular at the time like now a lot of the movements from that piece are better known mm -hmm. but at the time that that wasn't necessarily true and as you go through it you see the four seasons in a way are represented i think the um the special effects in this sequence are really incredible oh my gosh yeah, yeah really beautiful um I just really love how uh, water and dew mm. is shown in um, these like older, more d older Disney movies. The sequence with the Chinese mushrooms, they were originally lizards. I don't know how to feel about that particular scene. The little uh, mushroom's name was Hoplo. And, uh, you know, they it's, it's a kind of stereotypical kind of <laughs> representation. And we were watching like one trailer from back in the day where they're like, Hoplo is like, uh, <laughs> what does it say? The, the, the new dopey. The new dopey. Mm -hmm. And it's like, it's like in there for 25 seconds. Like, I it's guess. not that big. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is funny too, because, but you know, like later on, we we also found out that Dopey might have been considered for the Sorcerer's Apprentice mm -hmm. sequence too. Although it seems kind of like I don't know if there's like a firm confirmation of that. Mm -hmm. It as seemed like it might have been a possibility, but I don't know. I think people still just wanted Snow White so badly. It's like the, <laughs> you have that big success. I think that's why they originally wanted Dopey involved. Because it's like, oh, here's a character that's been tested, yeah. and everyone loves him. And, right. Um, and that can possibly explain Mickey's uh, outfit in Sorcerer's Apprentice, where, like, Baggy. the very long sleeves and the... F I think his feet were the same, too. Yeah, his feet were pretty big. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah the same, like, stocking-like shoe. Yeah. 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 So, but I, I'm, I'm kind of glad that they went with Mickey. There's a very sexy fish in this scene <laughs> that they yeah. modeled after like an Arabian dancer, which now that I'm saying that out loud is, is a little, I don't know how to feel about that either. Did they, they, so they actually modeled it off an Arabian dancer? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, kind of like a, like a harem dancer. <laughs> like, okay. I, I mean, I will say they, they, they already had a lot of practice with um, Cleo from Pinocchio, mm -hmm. so they had a lot of like realistic fish movements, um, and then you have the fairies, which I think are so beautifully yeah, done. Those are so great. And you have just the way the flowers are, and just the way the camera moves through this whole piece is remarkable. So despite it's it's kind of like eh, I don't know if certain parts dated well from it. I, it might still be my favorite sequence from the whole thing. Because I think it really captures like just the movement of what you can mm -hmm. do with animation and music combined together. Like there's this, there's this sense of like, like you don't need all the dialogue to tell tell a story in a way. And right. it, it's not even like a complex story. It's just the story of the seasons yeah. in a way. But it's so so remarkably told. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, it's interesting is that there's not even like sound effects throughout the movie, which I no. think was very bold. You know, it could have been very easy to have sort of like Looney Tunes, like, you know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, as an aside, Looney Tunes did do uh, a satire of Fantasia um, <laughs> that we watched. It was called. Yeah, it's it pretty good. It was, it was called A Corny Concerto. Kind of parodying uh, like uh, silly symphonies. Yeah, you know? absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> the next sequence is The Sorcerer's Apprentice by, I believe, Ducas, based on Goethe's poem of the same name. Uh, that was actually the first sequence they chose to do this with. It originally started as Walt and Stokowski talking about just doing an isolated short. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, they recorded the music at like, I think it was midnight or something like that. Oh. And Sikowski wow. just made them all like drink a bunch of coffee because like, I want them super alert. <laughs> it's gotta be like this, this you know, beautiful hour, night, or whatever. And he just like put his all into it. And by the end, he was like mopped with sweat. And they had to keep <laughs> bringing him towels and stuff. But that was like the whole like once that went so well as it did, they were like, I think we can make a full yep. feature out of this whole concept. I like it a lot. Um, I like how the new Mickey is introduced because yeah. he used to have the um, the pie eye, mm. um, as they call it, and this was his first time ever seen with, I guess, the dot eyes. Yeah, the, the pupils. Big circle. Yeah. Like, his features are very babyfied. <laughs> yeah. By this point. And I think this is like the first time we've seen the modern Mickey. Yeah, which I still prefer, like the old school, old, old school, like mm -hmm. 20s, 30s, uh, kind of scrappy Mickey. Yeah. I feel like they have a little bit more of that in the more modern Paul Ruddish 
uh, Mickey shorts. But oh, mm -hmm. from that time, I mean, I, I can't I can't necessarily blame them. I think from a character design perspective, it, it probably makes more sense for them, and it probably was easier to fit in with their like where their style was evolving. Yeah, you know? I think it would have looked dated if they still had it today. Right. Um, although even though everyone's in, into nostalgia nowadays, right. <laughs> I think it would have been accepted now. You know, it would have looked pretty dated. Yeah. Then. The wizard, uh, this is a pretty common, commonly known trivia fact, but the wizard is somewhat modeled after Walt himself. Mm -hmm. And in fact, his character's name is Yeznid, which is Disney backwards. His, in particular, his brow when he's upset and how he would kind of raise an eyebrow was very much modeled after Walt. I wish I could do that. <laughs> it's just like, mm. I can't, this is me trying to raise my eyebrow. <laughs> you also I can't, can't wink. I can't wink. <laughs> <laughs> A like, woman of many limitations. You do it. <laughs> <laughs> I can't do it. But you know what, Sam? For for all that you cannot do with your winking, you have so many other talents that we oh, love, know, and you. appreciate. Thank you. We actually did watch the 2010 Nicolas Cage Sorcerer's Apprentice out of curiosity. Mm -hmm. I thought it was going to be god awful, and I, I think it was fun. It was a fun movie. Yeah, I. I enjoyed it. Like, I wasn't expecting to, but I enjoyed it. <laughs> like you said, you do like fantasy, though. I do like fantasy, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, that, that was something where it's like, you know, we also are kind of checking out live action adaptations or reimaginings that happened years later. And that was one where I was like, you know what? Had a fun time with that. And, you know, also, it's a little cheesy. That's okay. It's very cheesy. I like a little cheese. So. I would not compare it anywhere near Fantasia, but it no. did have a couple Fantasia references. So, mm -hmm. I mean, it's on Disney+. Plus. You can watch it, check it out, I guess. Next is Rite of Spring by Stravinsky. This was the only segment that featured a composer that was still alive at the time. Hmm. Uh, Walt brought Stravinsky in, and there's a lot of stories about how much he hated this like years later the the way they interpreted with the, the... Uh, composer hated it right yes. yeah yeah but i mean at the time though if you look at it it doesn't seem like he did at first like he mm. seemed like kind of interested and he was even talking about doing other similar orchestral pieces with disney for mm. future possible fantasias years later he called the whole thing an abomination which is uh you know igor is pretty it's pretty yeah. harsh man but uh it's one of those things where I think this sequence had a lot of influence, uh, even down to sometimes being shown in science classrooms at the time. And mm -hmm. it's something where they were trying to be as accurate as they possibly could be when it came mm -hmm. to representing evolution and how dinosaurs were. But, you know, we've learned a lot since 1940, and so I wouldn't say it's entirely accurate today. Mm -hmm. I mean, surprisingly, um... I love dinosaurs, like Jurassic Park is my favorite thing. I've read the book and watched the movie, but um, I this was probably one of my least favorites. It was just a little boring for me. Yeah, the, the dinosaurs themselves are like a little bit clunky for me. For me, my favorite part is the buildup where you see the history of evolution. Oh yeah, that, that part's really cool. After that, I just think it's kind of like a long... It's just really long. Yeah. Yeah. Even being abbreviated. And I know they were nervous about abbreviating some of the pieces, but Stokowski kept on telling Walt, like, it's okay, you know, this isn't like an mm -hmm. actual full concert. You know, you just like hit all the all the most important parts of the piece and yeah. you know, people will follow along. Because otherwise each segment would be like half an hour or whatever, and that would be pretty long. Uh, even for already being as long as it is. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I, I, I do, I, the first step is amazing. And again, once again, incredible technical effects oh, that absolutely. still are so yeah. cool. Um, but yeah, the dinosaurs kind of lose me a little bit, but- it, it's, This is the one I usually skip when I watch the movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so, but you don't hate it as much as uh, Stravinsky did, right? No, <laughs> no, no, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, e even that whole first shot where you're just falling through the universe. Yeah. And you know, of course, that's it's really like, cool. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and that's like way before, obviously, we had any sort of NASA imagery or mm -hmm. anything. Then we get the intermission. Uh, we have a moment where, you know, again, they kind of goof around. There's a bit where they're kind of playing around on the instruments, doing mm -hmm. a little jazz improv thing. And then the soundtrack itself, you know, it's perfectly symmetrical. And the, r the way they did that is they only animated half a piece of paper. Oh, and then yeah. unfolded yeah. it and, <laughs> and filled in the other half so you had perfect symmetry with the mm -hmm. way. And again, this is another instance where, kind of like we were saying earlier, it just 
really takes advantage of what they're trying to do with this mm -hmm. whole project and it's just like it's just a cool little charming moment I think I love that moment yeah I really do I, I love the colors and how shapes represent the instruments kind of like the very first segment yeah yeah, yeah absolutely mm -hmm. and then we have the pastoral symphony so <laughs> up until this point I think at least for me I love each and every segment in front of mm -hmm. this, even with like, again, little, little things we're complaining oh, about, yeah. but like, it's only because they're trying to do something so impressive that the little things like that stand out for me. Mm -hmm. But I think this is the moment Pastoral Symphony is the only one that you and I kind of give a thumbs down to. <laughs> I would say it's the weakest point of the entire movie, and yeah. I've heard other people say that too. Mm -hmm. Not to say, not to like, a lot of work, a lot of work went into it, um, and a lot of special effects were used, but mm -hmm. uh, I would say yeah, it's definitely the weakest point of the entire movie. Yeah, well, let's let's think about the positives. We like we yeah. like the Pegasus, right? Oh, those are great. I I uh, I love drawing horses, and I really admire like when people do it well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and those are nice, and there's some nice like kind of soft colors, very mm -hmm. uh, very pastel, mm -hmm. uh, pastoral, you know, kind of like. <laughs> Uh, but what don't you like about this segment, Sam? Well, so what we do for each episode is we write notes on what we're going to talk about. And this note we wrote down here is Sam hates the centaurs. <laughs> <laughs> the, the centaurettes are fine. I think their their anatomy is very believable. Uh, Those were designed by Freddie Moore. Freddie Moore. Yeah, and they became known as like... Freddie Moore girls because he has that like distinguished style with he, drawing women. Yeah. yeah. Very, very young, nubile young women with uh, perky body parts. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then you have the the centaurs, the male centaurs, who uh I'm sure Arthur Babbitt was good at many other things, but uh he he's the one who drew Geppetto, right? Yeah, and, yeah. He, and he did a lot of other, like, incredible stuff at he, Disney. Yeah, like, he, I I think what it was is he was better at caricature rather than drawing proportional human beings. Right. And it definitely shows in this part. Um, I, I comment every time on it, every time I see it. It's just, it's definitely my least... Put. If, if, if this segment is the weakest point of the movie, the centaurs are the weakest point of the weakest segment. And what throws you off the most about their design? Their torsos. <laughs> their torsos throw me off so much. And Disney is afraid of, of showing nipples. Yeah. There's no nipple. <laughs> Did he also do the gods in the later later on? Yeah, you yeah. Have... Their faces <laughs> Zeus bother and me so much. And also their anatomy is way off too. Yeah. Um and I'm not even like, I draw people, I'm not an expert, but I can still see it's way off. I can still tell. Yeah. Yeah. But... They feel very stocky. Yeah, they're and, very blocky, stocky. Like, uh, the torsos bother me because instead of showing that they have possibly, like, muscles and a mm -hmm. rib cage, uh, it's like a chunk of meat, you know? <laughs> and like... it doesn't seem like there's much form to it. And then, um,. Their arms are too short, and they're like really, really stocky. You it's like know? someone pulled the wrong lever at the My Little Pony factory, and they just kind of <laughs> became this misshapen sort of strange figurines, I guess. Yeah, and and not to say that like stockiness is bad. I just mm -hmm. it's not a believable stockiness in my yeah, opinion. You know. Yeah. So actually, Bill Titla, um, who had wanted to work on the horses because he he loved horses. Uh, he called the, the finished product gutless. He called them castrated horsies, uh, the centaurs. But you know what? One week segment in a masterpiece like Fantasia. Oh yeah. I'm fine with that. You know. <laughs> it, and then, again, I think their ambition. You know, I see. I see some. There's still some beautiful parts about mm -hmm. about that whole bit. This has been a long journey for Disney to master the human form. Oh, yeah. um, because like you have Snow White where they were like relying heavily on footage um, and so these the figures were so kind of stiff uh, a little bit yeah really stiff and like they were kind of afraid to like um, what's the word stylize it a little bit more it's like you can tell they were afraid mm -hmm. trying the figures because they were relying so heavily on the footage yeah um, and yeah they were afraid to stylize it but mm -hmm. I, I think the first time they really start stylizing 
successfully, in my opinion, is um, in uh, Sleeping Beauty. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's a great balance. Yeah. Especially with, like the fairies. We should mention there are various versions of this film. O originally, they wanted to uh, make the centaurettes nude. That did not end up working. The Hayes uh, committee essentially censored them. Mm -hmm. The centaurettes got censored. You, you said they're originally nude. Mm -hmm. um, however, the fairies did say stay nude. Right, right. Um, I think that was a very safe type of nude, though. Yeah, like of you, course. like I, I thought, I, I thought that was fine. It makes sense that fairies would be nude. Why would they have clothes? <laughs> right. Why? And a lot of uh, you know classic art. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of nudity. So it's, if you're trying to evoke a sort of highbrow uh, approach to art, I don't know, seem like maybe... Don't be afraid of the human body. Exactly. Don't be scared. <laughs> and uh, in an early version of the film, it gets explicitly racist. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, it's... I'm glad that in later versions of it they clean that up. It's it's still kind of awkward. The, the servant mm -hmm. characters are the ones that are racially characterized. Um, so... There are, there are other versions of this film that, where they just thought it was too long at certain times and they mm -hmm. chopped it down. Uh, thankfully, the version that you can find now is probably the most complete version, which is the, I think it's about 130 minutes, making it mm -hmm. Disney's longest movie to date, I believe. So it's, oh, okay, it's, it's a long yeah. one. If you're going to watch this one, sit down for a while. Mm -hmm. But thankfully, after the Pastoral Symphony, you have Dance of the Hours by Ponchielli, uh, which I think is phenomenal mm -hmm. uh, and is considered by some to be just like one of the high points of animation oh, in the yeah. 20th century. It's it's so fun and characterized and it's this it's this satire of the ballet, but it only comes from knowing how ballet typically works mm -hmm. that 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 satire can be made, you know. And uh, two of the inspirations for that were Heinrich Play and T.S. Sullivan, who would often do these kind of fun caricatures mm -hmm. of, you know, these animals. large animals in particular doing, you know, human things, which, you know, it never gets old. I mean, Disney did it with Zootopia. How many years later? <laughs> it's still, it still works. We still love to see animals doing funny human things. Hyacinth Hippo. Correct. And then Ben Alligator. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Good. I got it right. And even though he's like, I don't know, he's kind of like being a little creepy. Like it's it's done very tongue in cheek. You never actually believe that oh, yeah. he's creepy. At he's like a theater point. villain. Yeah, it's very like, Ugh, and like, like Saturday know. morning cartoon. Yeah, very bold, strong thing. And by the end, it's it's almost like these characters are actors in a way. Mm -hmm. And just the, the the difference between the movement of these two characters, I think, really again shows off how much fun they must have been having doing mm -hmm. this. Even even like just this like the scene that they're in. I love this like tiered like column structure that mm -hmm. they're in while they do this. It's just everything about it is so cool. Oh, I forgot we do have Madame Upanova is the ostrich. Oh, okay. So yeah, we can't forget about her. No. And then finally, in my opinion, well, you know, I, I know I said the Nutcracker Suite was what was maybe my favorite, but Night on Bald Mountain. I mean, come on. Oh my gosh. That's like, pretty excellent. Just one of the best animated moments. Like, one of the best film moments. Let's, let's even take it out of it. One of the best film moments of all time, in my opinion. So actually, maybe that, that one actually might be my favorite. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> it's stuff like this that I'm just like, you go through this whole experience, then like, it just takes you in a place where you're just not used to Disney going. Mm -hmm. It's so like, gothic and dark and just like, it's, it's like this pagan, you know, like really taking it to the roots of mythology sort of moment. At, at Chernobog in particular was based off of Slavonic myth. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't know, and Bill Titla, who also worked on earlier segments, animated Chernobog, and he just, he just gives it everything. <laughs> Interestingly, uh, the director for that segment asked Bela Lugosi to come in, who was a famous uh, silent film actor and but he was known for doing like these universals you know monster movies and so he, I, he was like a little bit too dramatic I think for what they wanted mm. even though I think that character is already very <laughs> over the top oh so he was referenced for Chernobog originally okay yeah but then eventually the director himself was just like uh, I'll just try it out, you know, and like mm -hmm. they ended up using more of his reference if anything I, I agree it definitely takes you on like a little journey um, 
and the special effects they used were really incredible. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's one of those things where it's like, I can't imagine Disney doing anything like this today. Mm -hmm. It's so, it's so, again, it's just like, I don't want to keep on throwing around the word artful, but when you see moments like this, it like, it shows you what you can do with animation. Mm -hmm. Even to this day, all these years later, it still like blows me away. It's just like, it's, it is so incredible. I can't rave about it enough. Uh, one of the people responsible for the art in that was Kay Nielsen. And if you look at Kay Nielsen's concept art, like, and, or even most of the concept art for Fantasia, they did an incredible job transferring the feeling not even just the feelings, like sometimes the concept art looks like a frame from the movie. It's, it's mm -hmm. incredible. And Kay Nielsen was, was pivotal to Night on Bald Mountain. They had a couple other ideas that they ended up scrapping, including the devil almost as a mad musician playing the violin on the top I of the mountain. I would love to see that. <laughs> yeah, very Nero. Yeah, that visual. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that would have been really cool. But yeah, I mean, I can't complain. It's still one of the Again, one of the best scenes in film, in my opinion. And then we end with Franz Schubert's Ave Maria, which I know some people find a bit boring, but I, I still love this sequence too. It, it kind of feels like this like deep breath out after mm -hmm. Night on Bald Mountain, or even just like this whole experience where you've just, you've been hit with these marvelous images and, and just to kind of stay on one mm -hmm. to finish it out. It's, it's so poetic. Um, and you would be surprised, but that was probably the most difficult sequence to film in the entire thing, right? Yeah, because then they have to like, they had to move the camera throughout that entire long sequence, right? Yeah. Well, yeah, because, you know, typically they had some of these multi-plane sequences. We talk about that in other episodes where you had this incredible machine where they mm -hmm. were able to manipulate layers. But this one was so big, they just had to stand it upright and put it in their sound stage and just track mm -hmm. it down a long path. But so much went wrong with this. I mean, at first, when they, when they filmed it for the first time around, uh, they had some problems getting like it kind of jittered. It mm -hmm. wasn't it wasn't staying steady like they wanted to, and this was cutting it like pretty close to when they were supposed to be screening it for the first time, the the whole film. So, well, it's like I, you you got to do it again. I'm sorry, this just isn't up to our standards. So the next time they did it again, the lens was not the uh, set up properly Aww. so you had the scene but in the background it was it was too wide and you could see like everyone walking behind it and <laughs> which i would love to i don't know if they still have that footage i would love to see that footage it'd be cool to like see this time lapse of people behind it but uh obviously not what you want for the feature film mm -hmm. uh so they're cutting it even closer now it's, it's getting like to the wire but they had to do it again so they started over again, they're tracking along, and so it's taking days upon days, and then an earthquake hits, and it yep. messes up the shot, so they have to start over again. And at this point, Walt would like basically lock these people in the soundstage to record this. There was one person who worked on that sequence that was actually supposed to be getting married uh, at that time, and Walt begged him, he was like, if just please get married here in this room. I will have the Philadelphia Orchestra and Stokowski perform for you at your wedding or something. I don't care, just please don't leave. <laughs> so finally, they got it right all the way through. It's finally finished and they rushed it on a plane and it was split into the rest of the film four hours before the premiere. It was that close to the line. So, I mean, I think they got a week-long vacation after they filmed that sequence, but I think you argued they probably deserved even more than that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so we're basically working 24 hours straight to get this thing done. It's absolutely insane. But it just goes to show, you know, they aren't happy having a second best product. They yeah. want to have the, you know, what they want in, as the final vision. Mm -hmm. So the film is finally released, and it doesn't do well. It, uh, part of this was because World War II was really starting to flare up and we, you know, they weren't able to get it overseas like they wanted to. Uh, another thing is that like a lot of the theaters couldn't accompany for things like Fantasound and, mm -hmm. and blowing up the image as big as they wanted it. So it was compromised and they had to cut it down again to, and it just, it was supposed to be this sort of like special experience and they couldn't make it as special in order to actually get it out there to most people. And uh, it would find later success. I mean, it, it was re-released re -released many times years later, mm -hmm. including in the 60s, uh, which appealed to a lot of the psychedelic nature as uh, a lot of that was coming into fruition. 
but uh, it was it was kind of a shame that this like groundbreaking film, which is still so you know ahead of its time, just it just didn't do what it needed to do. And it's kind of a shame because I think it kind of scared Disney away from doing something like as experimental and out there. And mm -hmm. I think he even sort of like didn't disown it, but he kind of said like, ah, oh, maybe we were trying to bite off too much and stuff mm. like that years later and it's something where you know I wish so badly it would have done well because I mean like they wanted to do other Fantasias and it could have become this kind of new medium where it's this ever-evolving film mm -hmm. and it might end up different depending on what theater you're at or it might end up different if you wait a few weeks to see it again they might have added a new segment and swapped out another one it just would have been constantly evolving mm -hmm. um and you you love the Fantasia model. I know you've oh, been yeah. like, begging them to make another one someday. I would love that. I, I'm a fan of classical music, and I'm also a fan of animation. So like this is a really um, a great marrying of the two. Yeah. Um, and I, I think there's a lot of things they could have done with it. Now, because they had thought about doing more Fantasias, there are some sequences that either didn't make it to the film that ended up being made into later segments, whether it was in Fantasia 2000 years later, or even in packaged films like Make Mine Music. Uh, and there are some that just never ended up anywhere. And those are well worth seeking out on YouTube. There's but there's a baby related one. Yeah. There's another- The baby ballet. Yeah, there's, there's one where this um, swan is like going through this cave and stuff. It's very spooky. Oh. I honestly think if they had made another one, um, they would like, or if they make another one today, I think it'd be widely received. Yeah, at least you know, I think. At least in the animation community. Yeah. You know. I know it wouldn't make you know it wouldn't make money like Frozen or something like yeah. that. But you know, for, for all us people who still like dearly love animation, it would be so cool. I think the closest thing that we have. Hi, Kiwi. This is our cat, Kiwi. <laughs> She's new. Well, <laughs> relatively speaking, um, I think the closest thing we have are sort of the uh, shorts on Disney Plus that have been coming out where they've been letting animators uh, kind of play around with their experimental mm -hmm. program. So y there's some Fantasia-like stuff with that, but yeah. yeah, it would be really cool if they brought this model back someday. Oh, absolutely. But you know who else has strong feelings about Fantasia? John Kane Maker. Mm -hmm. So how about we go to his interview right now? John Kane Maker, it's a real pleasure to have you here with us today. Um, we're so honored that you uh, took some time out of your busy uh, your busy life to talk to us. <laughs> well, it's a pleasure to be here and to, to see you both, Joe and Sam. You're an animation historian. You are a celebrated animator yourself. You have taught uh, animation at various universities. You are just someone that I think uh, a wide swath of the industry really looks up to and respects. And one of the many things that you've done is that... Uh, You've also recorded audio commentaries for some of the classic Disney films when they re-released them in the 2000s. And in your Fantasia commentary, you say, it's wonderful to see even a single line in animation take on a personality. And that's really the essence of the magic of animation. And something we've observed in your work is how much of that bouncy abstraction you put into almost everything you do, whether it's, you know, people who transform into blobs and then lines and then back to faces and then places and <laughs> or whether it's uh, some of your incredible work such as Bridge Hampton, which relies on almost sort of poetic uh, form of storytelling. So when it comes to like abstraction and these sort of uh, shapes and lines and figures, was Fantasia a major influence on you? Oh yeah, absolutely. I, uh, I love the film. A lot of parts of it, uh, some parts not so much, but I, I <laughs> it was a big influence on me. Uh, Bridge Hampton, as you mentioned, is a, a very free form, uh, you know, dancing leaves and flowers and abstractions that turn into the wind and, and uh, snow and wind and uh, ocean. Another film I did was with classical music, and that was Mendelssohn's uh, Scherzo from A Midsummer Night's Dream. It was a film called Bottom Street. So again, that sort of influence of classical music and the old Fantasia kind of got in there as well. Um, I first saw Fantasia when I was 12 years old. This was in, uh, let's see, when was it? 1956. And uh, I was uh, 
living uh, with my family in, in uh, Elmira, New York. And uh, my father took my brother and I out to a movie theater and he, he fell asleep during the film. <laughs> Asia. And my brother was busy eating popcorn and candy, but I was mesmerized by what was uh, was on the screen. There was uh, all these uh, dinosaurs, which I love dinosaurs. And uh, there were dancing mushrooms and mythology and centaurs and uh, ballets with hippos and alligators. I mean, it was uh, an incredible thing. And I, I had never seen anything like it. And uh, so I ran to the library afterwards to see if there were books on it. And there were, there were about five or six uh, books on the making of Fantasia and the Deems Taylor, that big book that he did. And, and then some of the uh, smaller uh, books as well. But it's always been, a, I think, an influence on many young people. I know not, not only artists, but um, people like uh, uh, Stephen Jay Gould, who was a paleontologist and, um, he, he said that he was inspired by uh, Fantasia. And uh, Steven Spielberg, of course, is a big Disney fan. And um, uh, the conductor, Michael Tilson Thomas, he, uh, he said that that's where he first heard uh, Stravinsky. Incredibly influential film through the years, and I think it will continue to be that. Yeah, Sam, you're a big dinosaur fan yourself, even. <laughs> yeah, that's why I'm so happy to hear you say that. <laughs> <laughs> you wrote a book about Herman uh, Schulteis, who yes. was there at this time period that Fantasia was being produced. Um, and he had this remarkable notebook where he kept track of some of these like extraordinary innovations that the company was creating at the time uh, to match just the, the grandeur of Fantasia, um, amongst other films. So given uh, those sort of technical feats as, as mentioned, what are some of your favorites that the, that the film takes on? I think in terms of uh, technical uh, quality, it's incredible that the film is only about 10 or 11 years after Steamboat Willie. <laughs> and I know that Steamboat Willie was a, a breakthrough in sound and music and com combining that with, you know, uh, music effects and, and uh, sound effects and voice. But um, then along about, you know, 10 years later comes the beginning of Fantasia. And, uh, you know, it's, it's an incredible leap in terms of technical uh, prowess. Um, in that film, I, I really um, love seeing how the snowflakes were made. And in the Schulteis book, it's called The Lost Notebook, I was able to um, uh, look at photographs in which it explained exactly how they put it together. And it was a very mechanical thing because you, you know, the, the snowflakes going through the sky are so delicate and beautiful. And, and uh, but underneath it all was really a, a form of a mechanical puppetry. Mm. And uh, what I mean by that is they first, um, well, they decided that they couldn't draw it because the, it would wobble, you know, on the screen. They wanted it to be like rigid designs, real designs of snowflakes. Mm. So first of all, they, they looked them up on books or photographs. They had an inker trace them. Then they had a painter do some translucent paint on the back. Uh, and then they cut them out in these intricate designs. So they're on a piece of rather stiff um, celluloid. They attach those to spools, like, um, you know, thread spools, you know, when you're sewing. And then they put them onto uh, tracks, a Lionel tra train tracks. And then they put black velvet underneath that. And then they move them frame by frame by frame down the tracks. And if you remember the ending in, in uh, the Nutcracker Suite, they're like nine cuts from one angle to another. So this, uh, this team, whoever it was, maybe it was one person, might've been two people, but they had to move those and change the camera. It took, I would think, weeks for them to do that final uh, montage of, uh, of snowflakes falling. So I, I think that's a, a great one. One of the other ones that I really like is um, the volcanoes in uh, the Rite of Spring. Uh, the way they did those, according to Herman Schulteis notebook and his photographs, is that they, um, they decided that to paint would be the thing to use and they would shoot it in slow motion. So they, they created these um, plaster of Paris volcano, uh, you know, mountains, 
they put them upside down in water, in a tank of water. And then at the top, they would squeeze uh, white paint through. And they did it to the music, you know, because in that section, it's boom, 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 boom. So <laughs> they would squeeze it and out would come the, but it would be upside down. But the camera too was upside down. So they turned that around. They put it through an optical printer eventually, and they combined it with uh, other, you know, animated effects of lava and stuff like that and put it over a background. So it went through maybe, I would say three or four or maybe more iterations within the camera and through the optical printer, which is another uh, mechanical, you know, thing to, to put the films together. The other thing that's impressive, if I might, I don't, shouldn't call it mechanical because it isn't, but it's, it's the acting in the animation, uh, the devil on bald mountain, you know, basically that that section of the film is is just you know choreography and doing a lot of hocus pocus and special effects shadows and stuff like that. But when the bell rings from the church, then the devil has to go through all of these these feelings of what was that and starting to to do his pocus pocus again and then hear it again and it starts to hurt and then he hears it again and he starts to cringe on it and he get, becomes angry at one point and then goes away again and then finally ends up just, you know, uh, hiding from it. It's a great acting by Vladimir Teitler, who is the animator of that. The other one, of course, is Mickey Mouse. And I, I feel that's his best, greatest performance ever. You know, he sees so many emotions uh, in terms of, of uh, what he's going through. The range of acting is, is, is incredibly wide. He's, first he's exhausted, then he's confused, then he's um, sneaky, he's bold, he becomes pompous at one point and starts to direct the heavens, horror stricken because of the brooms, he's remorseful when he kills them, but he's, he's angry when he kills them. So he's a murderous mouse. Uh, <laughs> and at the end, he's obsequious again to the sorcerer. So it's an incredible range. And um, it reminds me of uh, Jean-Louis Barrault, who was in uh, Children of Paradise, uh, uh, called Les Enfants du Paradis. He, he plays three characters in mime, uh, and it, it's a great range of, of pantomime and emotion, but I think Mickey Mouse also rivals it. I, I get the sense that there's a lot of vaudeville and a lot of silent film classic inspiration in a lot of these older Disney films that I don't think is um, tapped into as a resource in, in more modern ones. Yeah, that's a shame because it's all there. I mean, everything is on YouTube yeah. and Google, and there's no excuse for not looking it up and, yeah. and being inspired by it. You know, it's, it's there. It's very easy to do, and it's really great fun. I mean, it can take you back eons and, eight, you know, really old, old uh, performances, vaudeville and uh, music hall performances and stuff like that. So it's a great resource for animators. Do you think Fantasia's influence on both the animation industry and the Disney company could have been magnified even greater if it had been a box office success at the time? Yeah, I think so. And Frank Thomas, I believe in uh, the DVD that we did on uh, Fantasia back in 2000, I think he says something like that in the documentary section of it. He says, there's no telling where we would be today, meaning 2000, if Fantasia had been a success. And of course, the big thing personally that I feel was a little tear in my heart is where would we be today if that picture had been as successful as Walt had hoped it would be? Because it was really a very experimental uh, presentation. And, uh, and Disney, Walt Disney was interested in doing interesting techniques with it. And he wanted to do a road show of it after it played with Fantasound, which was the great breakthrough in um, uh, you know stereo for movies. Uh, but because the film was not successful, there were no more components of Fantasia that he was hoping he could put into the film and mm -hmm. continue it for years. If he did that, I mean, knowing how curious he was about things and how uh, interested in, in pushing the technology. I mean, even for the Fantasia we have, he was thinking about and exploring the possibilities of using 3D uh, widescreen, even a version of smell vision before smell vision came in. You know, he was talking about wafting perfume into the nutcracker suite in the theater uh, or having a, a smell of 
gunpowder when you were in the, you know, the devil on Bald Mountain, or even with the, the volcanoes, I think that was what that was, would have been for. Um, so there was a, a, a lot uh, that could have happened through the years if Fantasia had gone on. And of course, maybe we would have gotten into computer animation sooner. It, it often, when I'm watching Fantasia, it does feel like this surreal peek into the possibilities of what could have been and where things could have gone if, uh, you know, maybe audience, I mean, but even years later, like you said, you watched Fantasia on one of the re-releases. I feel like maybe it was just ahead of its time. I don't know if people were ready for something like that back then. Well, part of the reason it fails was financial because there was a war going on in Europe, which cut off both Pinocchio, which was made the same year, 1940 as Fantasia, both Pinocchio and Fantasia's box office was, you know, almost uh, more than half uh, gone away because of the war in Europe. Uh, but also uh, Pinocchio and Fantasia were different, different. He wanted to do things differently after, after Snow White. And the audience liked Snow White so much, they loved it. And they were wondering, wow, where is the date movie? You know, where is the, <laughs> the romance uh, that, you know, where's the prince and the princess? Uh, there was even a woman, I saw a letter once at the studio, wrote in about Fantasia and she called it a silent film. <laughs> huh. Huh. <laughs> Interesting. How do you make this film a silent film? Where's the songs and where's the, you know. The, <laughs> the whole thing's a song. <laughs> Exactly. So, uh, I think it really was truly ahead of its time. That's what I'm, I'm, I'm always very struck by, too. Is a, and one reason I love so many of these very early Disney films is, like, it takes me back a little bit that, like, most of the people working on these films were around our age, if not younger, mm -hmm. in many situations, and they're revolutionizing a whole medium. It's just, like, it really just blows me away all the time. But when, what year were you born, may I ask? The book? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, 95. Yep, same year. Isn't that the year that Toy Story came yeah. out? With mm -hmm. So you're right in, you know, you're in the thick of it here. Very true. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we talked earlier about, uh, you know, your work on au the audio commentaries in some of the early DVD releases of, of some of these films. And uh, I adore audio commentaries, and I was at the right age to like really be influenced, I think, partially to be fascinated by filmmaking because of these bonus materials. And so just yeah. on one hand, I'm so grateful. Thank, thank you for doing uh, projects like that to help inspire you know, people like myself when I was younger. Thank you. Um, I'm glad you uh, enjoyed them and learned from them. What was what was the process like? Because sometimes you were working in situations where you had quotes from Walt Disney that were being sort of uh, integrated into it, and you did ones with uh, people like Roy Disney uh, at the time. And and what what was that whole process like? It was great fun, basically. I mean, I love it. I love research, and that was the that was the heart of the whole thing. I love researching my books. I love researching if I'm doing a film, and I love you know doing the audio commentaries, but. Uh, yeah, it was um, a pleasure. And then, you know, you, you have the films there, which are set. So you have to sort of write a script and you have to figure out how much time you're going to need to, you know, put the words up there and see if they're succinct enough and clear enough uh, to get the ideas across. And then it goes on to the next one. Of course, it's all cut together and, and uh, you can do retakes and stuff like that. But um, no, it's, uh, you know, it, it was great. I, I, I think my favorite voiceover was, was for Dumbo and they, they used it on about three versions of the uh, of the DVD and then the the, the most uh, the latest one they decided not to use it but the, the Snow White one was interesting I think that's the one in which we had a conversation as it were with Disney or to to ask a question and he answered it sort of thing I think that's what we did on that and of course the Fantasia one was a, a great favorite as well so thank you you have a uh, an Oscar statue over there on your right hand shoulder. <laughs> What's he doing? <laughs> Where did he come from? <laughs> you won that for your short film, The Moon and the Sun, uh, which we found just like really ripped my heart open. <laughs> I mean, I don't know about you. Yeah, it was amazing. It's a film about your father and about the kind of painful relationship he had to your family. And it's very, it's very raw and honest in a way that I imagine for a lot of people would be very difficult to do. 
So do you have any advice for people wanting to make art that is forthright and honest in that sense, but maybe are a little bit scared to, to touch on those topics? Do it. You don't make a film to win a prize. I didn't make a film to win anything. I did it because I had to. I, I did many films over the years, the past 30 years or more, uh, on other people's stories. And I've done films on nuclear war and children's awareness of it and, and uh, child abuse. I've done uh, uh, films on an actress's life. I've done stuff, stuff on a stand-up comedy's life. I've done insertions in uh, documentaries of various sorts. And I, you know, I felt, well, I've had this life, this story, and I thought maybe it's time for me to, to tell it. So um, I just started to, to work on it. And then, you know, it's funny, when you put the energy out there, good things come in or things that are meant to happen, start to happen. You're the spark plug though. You have to push it out there. You have to say, yes, yes, I'm going to do this. Yes, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start making some sketches and I'm gonna pull this together. And then, you know, a grant came in. I went to Italy for a month at the Rockefeller Foundation in Bellagio. I worked on the storyboard there. Um, uh, my producer, Peggy Stern, uh, saw the storyboard when I came back. She said, I wanna produce this. She did, we took it to HBO because I'd worked for Sheila Evans who, uh, you know, had hired me for a number of jobs. And she looked at it and says, yes, we'll give you your finishing funds for this. I mean, it was like rolling on a roller coaster. Once you start it though, I mean, it's important because you know, no one else is gonna do it. Yeah. I mean, you have a story to tell, it's your story and it's your style and it's your film. So do it the best you can, put your heart into it and just let it go and see what happens with it, you know? And then make more or not. <laughs> <laughs> it's always very it's tempting to look at the things that came before you and, and be like, what, what can I possibly contribute to, you know, all these masterworks? Um, so I think like, but, but like you said, like each person is a blend, a, like a very specific blend of influences that has never been made before anywhere mm -hmm. else. Do either of you draw? Oh yeah, you draw. Oh yeah, I you draw. draw. Beautifully. Yeah. You know, I teach at NYU and, and I've been there for almost 40 years now. In fact, I'm going to be retiring this year uh, from teaching. Congrats. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I can have more time to do other things. Wonderful. Yay. <laughs> and, uh, my students uh, in the storyboarding class, some of them often feel, well, I can't really draw and I don't have a style. But that's not true. You can draw. Mm -hmm. You've been drawing since you were a kid and you do have a style already. If you want to improve it in some way, then keep drawing and, you know, take some art lessons and, you know, just keep doing it because there's nobody like you. You're, you're unique. Each person is unique. And it's like signing your name. You have your own kind of signature. So you have your own kind of way of drawing, making films, and thinking about how you're going to present things. And look what you're doing now. You're doing this wonderful podcast. This is a very creative thing. Yeah, actually, um, we were wondering when it comes to your own artwork, do you, do you sell prints of your work? Because you had that one in your email that you sent to us that we were just like, oh, that'd be so lovely to have. <laughs> I haven't done that yet, but I do paint and I want to do more of it. This is a. <gasps> I love that. <laughs> oh, yeah. And I just did that one last week. And then this is a, this is a winter one. Oh. Oh, that's the remarkable. tree. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I love it. Yeah, this is a, a truck in, as we say. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll have to send you a few images of Sam's work. Oh, yeah. yeah, I'd love to see it. Oh. <laughs> one of the biggest inspirations for our show was uh, Mary Blair and actually um, one of <laughs> Joe's first gift to me when we started dating was uh, your book that you wrote on her and wow. I found it um, really inspiring um, reading about her and her story and um, I really didn't know much about her at the time which is like also what inspired us to make this show um, so that more people are aware of like you know these artists who work on these films and and how great they were, you know, um, and are. <laughs> so um, I was wondering, what was your favorite Mary Blair influence, whether it was she worked on a movie or what was your favorite piece of art that she worked on? Oh, I like uh, the stuff from South America. Yeah. She went there. That's where her style really 
uh, you know, um, became Mary Blair. She was a fine watercolorist. She was part of the uh, uh, California School of Watercolor. And she went to Chouinard Institute in Los Angeles. But um, she always had a slightly stylized quality to the work. And it really came out strong when she uh, went to South America in 1941 with Walt Disney. So I really like those uh, wonderful imaginative uh, characters that she came up in the beautiful colors. She was a great colorist and uh, really a, a fantastic artist. Also, uh, you know, I, I like her uh, work for the, uh, I call them the big three, Alice in Wonderland, Cinderella, and Peter Pan. You know, it's quintessentially Mary Blair stylized quality, but there's always a, um, a bit of Mary Blair's um, emotions mm -hmm. in the, she, she doesn't um, make um, very large pictures of, of humans, you know, um, they're small and usually in the in the picture, but the way the surroundings are, the colors that she used, you can you can get an emotional feeling from her work very clearly. And she was very inventive. She was really uh, perfect. They, Joe Grant, you know the name Joe Grant? Oh yeah. He told me. He said, "Oh, Mary was in, in, in unbelievable. He was uh, she was part of uh, the character model department for a very brief time. She worked on Dumbo stuff." He said, "We would just give her an idea, and she would go with it. She would just." you know, do one thing after another. Even the early sketches for um, Lady and the Tramp were, were done in the 1940-41 by Mary Blair, uh, working with Joe Grant on, on that. Wow. You know, she, was, um, she was quite incredible. Which Disney movie would you say impacted you the most on a personal level? Well, I'm going to be greedy uh, because <laughs> the first five features were big influences on, on me and loving Disney and Snow White, Pinocchio, Fantasia, Dumbo, and Bambi. Yeah, and particularly Fantasia, I would say. There was a, a, a film critic named um, Otis Ferguson in 1940, and he reviewed the film Fantasia, and he said, dull, dull as it is at the end. And, you know, it is pretty dull at the end. <laughs> on and on. I thought that through the forest. And he says, ridiculous in the bend of the knee uh, before art with a capital A, it is one of the strange and beautiful things to have happened in the world. Something never thought of before and not soon forgotten. How perfect is that? <laughs> well, th thank you, John, so much for, for talking with us today. You're, you're an absolute delight. Uh, and we, like I said, we, we have a lot of respect for the, the work that you do. And it's really influenced us a lot. Thank you very much. It was a great pleasure to meet you. Keep in touch. We just want to thank John so much for his kindness and for doing that interview with us. Um, it was, like I said, quite quite the honor in every mm -hmm. every regard. Oh, absolutely. And uh, I know you want to see more of his artwork as well. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so if you subscribe, we like to do these. It, it takes us a little while to get them done, and I have other videos I do too, but. Um, we're going to keep on chugging along through Disney history. We like to go back and forth between the more recent ones and the older ones. And so our next episode is going to be about Big Hero 6, which I know is a, a favorite of yours. Yes. <laughs> so please uh, give your thoughts below on Fantasia. Or if you have thoughts about Big Hero 6, we can talk about it in the next episode. But thank you once again for joining us. I'm Joe. And I'm Sam. I don't know if we said that at the beginning or not. <laughs> but this is not so small world, and we'll see you next time.